to the show. Uh, I'm Chad Perkins, uh, and with me again is Anna Carolina Pereira. I feel like I uh, don't do that very gracefully. Your name is like so <laughs> elegant, and there's not. I, I, there's My name Paul is really Shore difficult in English, so even I struggle with it in English. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Well, welcome back. Thanks for joining us again, Anna. Because uh, last week was really, really incredible. I think we're all just super stoked to see uh, what's what's coming up next. Uh, how, how are you doing, by the way? How's, how's life been treating you in the last week? I've been doing really well, a little bit too busy for my liking. Um, uh, that makes like eight months in a row, <laughs> uh, but other than that, I'm doing really well, excited for my new projects and this project here. Nice. Nice. And welcome out to everybody. Uh, thank you for, for joining us and let's just do a quick little bit of housekeeping so we can get this out of the way and get to Anna's presentation. Um, for all of our uh, Maxon presentations like this, we have these kind of things constantly, daily. Uh, you can go to the maxon.net uh, website, go to the news tab, go to events, and here you'll see all of our various shows, uh, including Maxon Color on this Thursday, I believe. Yeah, this Thursday. And um, uh, also, thank you to Max for working behind the scenes and producing this show and to Dr. Sassy and doing the timestamps for YouTube to make this much easier to watch. And speaking of YouTube, this session, like all of our sessions, uh, are recorded and posted to the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel within a day or so. Again, with timestamps, you can just jump right to where you want to go. Thanks to Dr. Sassy. And then also, uh, which kind of fun, is that uh, we've recently created... Um, a behind the scenes video for the ZBrush Summit that happened a couple months ago, which Anna Carolina created uh, a bunch of art for. So there's kind of like a two minute kind of like behind the scenes about the like virtual production studio that we shot in uh, and that kind of thing. Anna, do you have any like comments about that? Because you were involved in that process a yeah. lot. Yes, I was. So basically, we created a the, the two virtual sets that were used in the Zebra Summit, the Summit, all in Unreal, and you can actually see an entire video now on kind of how the process went. So you can find that in the Max on YouTube channel, right? Uh, and it's so exciting because it, without going into too much detail, we break down every single step that we did, and, uh, all the way from ZBrush and how we made the really complex models really easily to actually getting it in Unreal. And then of course, like the animations and the interactivity are all covered in that. Super exciting. It's like Gorgeous. a little diary, you know? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm so glad that we have this, all the behind the scenes, like pre-production stuff. That's just so helpful and exciting. I love digging into that kind of stuff. Um, finally, one other last little bit of stuff is that there is this link that we'll post in the uh, the comments. And if you follow this link and use the code Sculpting Worlds, I believe that's the code, right? Did I mess that up? Sculpting Worlds. Thank you, Max, for posting that. Sculpting Worlds in all caps. Um, so you have to have this exact link and then that exact code, and then you could get a free shirt or thingy <laughs> here in this list. And all you just have to do is pay for shipping. So it's our way of saying thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, supporting our shows and whatnot. Okay, now um, I can stop sharing my screen and hand this over to Anna Carolina so you can tell us about the magic that we're going to be learning about today, which I'm just thrilled about. So today is actually, you're right, it's where the magic happens, where a lot of people have questions, okay? Because what we're going to do is we're going to take our model out of ZBrush and into Unreal and going through all the different steps that you need to do for that, okay? Um, that being said, there are thousands of ways to do this. The way I'm showing today is going to be using all of the automated tools that ZBrush has in in store to our advantage. So we'll be using Zero Mesher, we'll be using UV Master, FBX, Export Import Plugin, and things like that. After we have a high and low poly created for our little guy, because that is the game pipeline, we make a high poly model that has all these wonderful little details. Then we make a low poly version that is lighter for the engine to render. And then we transfer the details from the high to the low using a process called baking. Baking is basically when you take those details and you turn them into a texture, a texture map that like 
bends lights, so to speak, that manipulates the way the engine will light something to make it look like it has detail. Let me give you guys a sneak peek. Here's Unreal. Unreal 5 specifically is what we're using today, okay? And here's our little guy. And even though he looks as detailed as he was in ZBrush, see the little scales on his belly and stuff like that? He's actually all textures. The scales don't actually exist, okay? So uh, we're going to be doing that. We're going to give him color, roughness, and uh, things like that, those kinds of textures in Substance Painter, making him glossy or not, colorful or not, that kind of thing. And then we're going to end up in Unreal setting up materials. We're going to set up a material that's like glassy for the outside of the eye. We're going to be doing material for the inside of the eye, the body, and everything else. We got a lot to cover today. So I hope you are all ready for this one, okay? So as you can notice, this little guy looks a little different than he did last time. I spent some time this weekend just wrapping him up, adding a couple of extra spikes. You want to see a secret? I didn't have time to finish the back. So we're just going to like not look at that at all today. Okay. Don't be like me. Don't do what I say, not what I do, right? <laughs> Chat's like laughing for you. <laughs> so we're gonna ignore that. And it's funny because I do that for every tutorial, right? And I tell myself, not next time. Next time I will behave and I'm going to do the backside and I never do. Uh, I just ran out of time so easily. But I went ahead and I added um Little scales for the tummy, for the tail. I made it nice and spiky. It's so going to give him like a defense mechanism. I redid the wing. Uh, similar process to last time, but I added a couple of tubes. If you guys have any questions about how I pulled this off, let me know. Okay. Uh, if there's extra time at the end, maybe I could go over the whole thing. But I just basically have like a little uh, plane with thickness full of like Damien Standard stripes on it and some tubes just to create some sort of like fin uh, structure. I finished up his little fingers and and, and claws. I added just a VDM, default creature VDM for the little claws that he has. And of course he has eyes too, but they actually are hidden right now. There you go. So let's start by organizing. Organizing, I think, is the first step. It is so easy, guys, when you are trying to go from high to low poly to disorganize. You know, you have to make sure that everything's living together. So you can actually kind of see a little preview here as well. I created one folder called high and one folder called low. And I have all of the pre-made high polys in one and all the pre-made low polys in the other. So if I actually um, go to the low poly body, actually it should be pretty low poly comparatively anyway. Kind of like so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide the low poly that I already brought with me because that's cheating. And we're going to make a new low poly from here. All right. Hey, Anna, so can, I, yeah? can I interrupt you with a question? Is that, is that okay, by the way? Please, all Sorry, the time. I, free, like... I probably, should, probably shouldn't put you on the spot like that because it'd probably be weird to be like, yeah, that bothers me like when we're on the air. Um, but, uh, but how do you go? Like, why would you take something like you've made this thing? It's like high poly. What and like Unreal Five, you could have like really like high res meshes and stuff like that. So, what's the the thinking behind taking this that's already like done in this great final spot and then making a low res version after that? Um, I guess we could use nanites if you wanted to, you know, like to keep it high poly, and then we wouldn't have to worry. That being said. Um, it's still my preference to do a low poly, even though the low poly we're doing, by the way, is not going to be super low. Like we're not taking it to the next level of, of low poly or anything. It's just going to be lower. Okay. But here's the thing. Um, I still have to export and import the files. That takes a while. The higher the poly, the longer that takes. I still have to open mm -hmm. it in Substance Painter and the higher the poly, the slower Substance Painter is going to run. So to some degree, like for me, and this is personal, like that whole Nanite workflow, is great within Unreal, but not necessarily everywhere else. You know, like if you make a rock mm. that is like 40 million polygons, uh, or let's say even more, you know, a billion polygons, <laughs> and you open that in Maya to like fix up the pivot point or something, that's going to like, you know, completely lag out or break up your computer or take a long time to load. So I wouldn't say that every other software package is caught up with the Nanite workflow yet. Uh, mm. Furthermore, Nanite does not actually work with skeletal meshes. So this little guy for today, he's going to be what meshes? Skeletal what meshes. So that's meshes, meshes that okay. have animation or deformation. So if it had, he had a rig, for example, he would be a skeletal mesh uh, because the rig okay. is also a skeleton, right? And we call the joints bones, things like that. Uh, so 
Nanite does not support skeletal meshes right now. And of course, they are going to eventually probably support that, and then we won't have to worry anymore. But Nanite is more so for uh, environmental pieces and set dressing, or like, you know, the things in the level, but not necessarily the creatures in the level and the humans and things like that. Um, hmm. Plus, it's still... Oh, okay, I can't speak for prop artists too much right now because I'm not a prop artist, but at least um, it's, it was very customary for years for when you submit your portfolio and for a game job, for people to be extremely um, judgmental of your topology, aka like you know the 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 polygon flow of the low poly, uh, and people are still like that. Um, you know, I've kind of like been like polling twitter here and there to like try to keep a, my finger on the pulse so to speak on that and people still care about good topology uh even though you know there's like one or two guys that are like i don't care anymore <laughs> and just use nanite <laughs> why don't you use nanite on that the last consideration is that not all games are next gen not all games are running on the kind of hardware that might benefit the most from nanites for example if you're still doing vr and mobile games i think you could still benefit from knowing the high to low poly workflow uh, all that being said, though, what I'm doing today is the automated lazy guys version of this. So if you actually want to do nice topology, you're going to have to do it by hand through a pro process called retopology, where in Maya or whatever software you want, you're going to have to draw out where you want each polygon. The reason we like to do that instead of using the automated process, especially for animated um animated meshes is because when you're deforming a mesh along the body or whatever it is, um, the polygon flow of the area, so like I'm pointing it to my elbow, polygon flow of the area actually does deform. And if it's all messy, it might deform in a weird, like crunchy way. Uh, and so you got to be nice and clean with that. So we still worry about that. Of course, I'm not sharing that today because that would be an entire other... <laughs> An entire other workshop, I think. We would take a month off to just do that. You know? <laughs> That's a whole other skill set. So today I'm just going to use Zero Mesher. And we're going to just... Thank you so much. Simple. No worries. Um, I see Elise in here in the chat. Maybe she has something to add as well. And she is a wonderful prop artist that does work um, for a bunch of AAA uh, experiences so and games <laughs> i just got out of vr vr class where we t call everything an experience um there she is um so maybe she'll have something to add about that whole spiel uh especially because she's in it right now you know like working as a prop artist right now you know uh whereas i'm just trying to like stay afloat and keep my eye or my ear to down to the ground on every single part of the gaming industry <laughs> you know um but anyway, this is the, the cheap, easy way if you just want to get something in Unreal real fast. I use this all the time for testing. So like if I want to ch just check out, see if my my textures are like, you know, uh, tech, um, check out if my textures are going to look good, things like that. So I'm going to grab my little high poly guy. And this is the first step that I did this all yesterday and I forgot this step like four times. It is such a tricky little step. Okay, before you do anything to the high poly, if you have layers, which is what I taught you last time, you want to bake the layers, okay? Uh, let me show you what happens if you don't. So I'm going to duplicate the high poly version of the lizard, okay? And duplicate that, wait a second. There you go. I'm gonna rename this one, keep it organized. Always rename them. So I'm gonna call this one body underscore low. And just to mat, oh, actually I should call that. Uh, yeah, I already have a body underscore low, so hopefully that doesn't mess up anything. And I'm going to call the high poly, I'm going to call it body underscore high. Um, the naming will actually matter in the long run. Okay, so like we're going to match every single high to low. We're going to match the first name perfectly, and then we're going to do underscore high or underscore low. Okay, so like make sure you're using same name and then high and low suffix. All right, so if I go to the new version, okay, that's still high poly because we haven't done anything to it. And I try zero meshing it, it'll it'll probably break and or turn like pitch black or funky colors. That's because of the layers. All right. So let's see. Zero mesher. I'm gonna keep it like a pretty high zero mesher, like 21k or something. Zero mesh that. It might even crash out. It's really bad to do this with layers on. Let's give it a second. Elise says, even Fortnite is only just starting to use nanites. No nanites for cosmetics, though. 
Oh, okay. It worked kind of nicely. <laughs> yeah, it still has a lot of potential problems. Like yesterday, whenever I was projecting, uh, for example, from the high to the low, you know, uh, to get the, the extra details and like shape on there. So if I select that low and I make, make the high poly visible, I can come here into, into project and I hit project all, which, which is a, a technique I use all the time. I think I even used it last time. You'll notice that the low poly is now like all black and there's like a couple of dots on it and things like that. See that? That's because of the layers. So I'm going to hide the low for now. Actually, I should undo that projection too, just in case it messes something up, right? So I'm going to hide the low and go to, go to the high, and I'm going to go ahead and bake the layers. Another important step when it comes to baking layers is make sure that you're not recording any layers. Otherwise, it'll misbehave. So bake all. And now the layers are cleared out. Hooray for us. That's the high poly. Let's go back to the low poly. And I think I undid the zero measure. So let's undo that. Oh, never mind. Let's zero mesh it again. Geometry, zero measure. This right here is the target polygon count. So I'm going to set mine to 21. I always kind of like, in my head, I equate like 21 to like 21,000. <laughs> so like I kind of just like make up a number in my head like, oh, 20,000 seems decent for this. And then I see if it is. If it like crunches down the, the silhouette too much, then I know that I need to go higher. If if it's, if it's still perfect, I'll try going lower until I hit like the lowest points that doesn't destroy my mesh. Hey, Anna, there was a question in the chat about um, the the ratio of how much you're breaking down from from high to to low. Is it like four to one or do you have like like a, a ballpark that you're trying to get it to um, or a, a ratio that you typically use? There, as far as I know, there isn't really a ratio. There's definitely an end goal though. So um, let's say you're working in production. Odds are you'll be told what the end goal is by somebody. <laughs> Normally, the mm -hmm. technical artists will give kind of like a, a threshold. Um, so, you know, I'll be like, hey, for this little guy, let's stick to 20,000 polygons or 20,000 tries, 100,000 tries. Um, the point being that uh, historically, polygon count has taken a big toll on, on game performance. You know, but that's historically. Nowadays, we have so much other things that also <laughs> impacts performance. Making video games is kind of a dance of, you know, giving and taking when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, optimization and performance. So that's one of my specialties uh, back in the field. You know, I always try to keep it running while also like trying to push the visuals as much as possible. But there's so many different factors of what can slow something down. But yeah, there's no ratio. There's only kind of an end goal. Um, so I hope that answers. And when it comes to what the end goal should be, it's so hard to answer that question. Trust me, I get that all the time because of my mentorship. You know, uh, kid, my mentees are like, hey, how much should I go for like a hero character? How much should a hero, char a hero character being like something that's a main important character that's either on screen all the time or has like a big moment, you know, that like requires way more budget in general, both money and performance wise uh, than like some like little chicken in the background, you know, that doesn't actually impact the, <laughs> the game. Um, and I'm like, I literally can't tell you because it depends on platform. So like, if you're doing something for the Switch, obviously it's not going to be the same as like a high-end PC, you know. Uh, it depends on how much time it's going to have on the screen, what else is going on in the levels. So like uh, if it's a, a big boss, let's say like a big boss, so it's kind of like an important character. If it's just in a dark cave, you might be able to push it more than if it's like flying around with an open world vista, you know, with clouds and VFX and things like that. So like everything impacts. So normally I just go for a random number that I think is challenging <laughs> for the person to achieve, but not, but still realistic. So I, I go for, uh, for example, if it's a hero character, I'll go for like a hundred K max, especially if it has accessories like clothes, uh, uh, weapon, hair, things like that. Um, it just really depends. So hard to answer. But real fast, I'm just going to, before I get lost forever in, in, in this particular question, I'm going to project again, this time properly with no layers. I'm going to project from the high poly to the low poly. So with the low poly selected and the high poly turned on, everything else hidden, I'm going to go and hit project all. It's going to now deform my low poly, let's check, to really conform to my high poly. See how the little scales on the side, for example, are more visible, right? 
So that's kind of what I did. It just stretched and molded my low poly to perfectly match my high poly. Um, you, any other questions, Chad, as far as that stuff is concerned? Um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm looking through them now. I'm still reading them. <laughs> so yeah, Elise says, nowadays the textures are hogging the resources, more resources in geometry. Yeah, materials, textures, like that's something we worry about a lot. Um, and those are actually harder to optimize, or not optimize, but also like uh, diagnose and optimize than meshes. I miss the days where I was just like, hey, your mesh is too heavy. Now I'm like, oh my God, what's in this material? Like, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> basically there are tools for that though so the fin high and low poly is very interesting i used a game forward technique for this okay so this is what the high high poly of the fin looks like and those of you who have done stuff for games before already know about alpha cards basically these are cards like this see that are planes normally lower poly than this this is not the most low poly alpha card of all time i'm gonna be honest with you but they're basically planes like this where we will bake the high poly down onto it and then use an alpha for transparency to kind of like cut the shape out of the plane so at the end in the game the plane will be the only geometry that that's actually in there but it'll look like this we use this for foliage grass hair what else do we use this for? I even use it for my character's earrings, but I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to. <laughs> so like basically at the end, we will project this, this fin onto the um, this plane and it will take on this shape. So as a little preview, like so, see that? It looks like the fin is here, but it's actually just a plane, all right? So if I were to take this material off and just put a random other material on, you'd see that it's actually two planes, like so. What I did to create this was I just made a plane that perfectly fits, like kind of on the fin, okay? So I just used the formers like I did last week, but on a plane. Planes already have UVs. They are perfect, like zero to one square UVs. Uh, we'll be talking about UVs in a little bit. Uh, let me know if I'm going too fast. For, I'm kind of here like game terminology. Let's go, you know. So like, let me guys, let me know if I'm going too fast. I will slow down. Um, so this plane is what's going to receive the fin texture. So the fin is literally just a stamp, basically. Okay. So my 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 plane, the low poly plane is already done, like so. Now I have my low poly little guy, and I have my eyes which I'll just make the eyes low poly uh, as well by just like going down to a lower subdivision. Maybe this one here. I'm going to reorganize. So let me go ahead and like, you know, delete the old low poly body. And I'm just going to grab the body low and I'm going to put it in the low folder. There. So now I have two folders. One's called high and one's called low. And we have body high, body low, fin high, fin low, and eyes. I don't really feel like I need to create a high poly for the eye because it's just a round sphere and I'm not really gonna bake it. In the past I have, but for this one, I'm not going to, okay? So now we have this all organized. If we want, we can kind of like preview each one uh, by, by selecting the folder. And I'm gonna make sure again that everybody's named correctly. So body underscore low, body underscore high, things like that. The suffix is going to matter. Just because in Substance Painter, there are automatic tools that will steal those details from the high poly and put it on the low but they will actually look at the suffix to make sure that the fin doesn't actually go onto the body and that the body doesn't go onto the fin and that the fin doesn't go onto the eye. So that's why we're organizing little names, okay? So here's another important thing you need to know about Unreal and you know game art in general. Um, game art needs UVs, okay? Because we're going to be adding textures that are just 2D images that contain pixel data, basically. And we're gonna apply those onto the mesh in Unreal. That means that UVs are absolutely necessary. Otherwise, the, the 2D texture wouldn't know how to plot itself onto the model, OK? A lot of other pro programs you can do without UVs. You can just use vertex paint and fancy materials. Do you guys use a lot of UVs in Cinema 4D, Chad? Do you know? Um, yeah, I think UVs are a, a thing. There's like we a, a few years ago, we just revamped the whole engine for 
UVs. I, I suck at it, so I'm not the world's greatest authority <laughs> on that. But yes, I know that there's like a, an, a UV world inside of cinema. But you can get away without them too, right? Um, pro probably. I want to say uh, <laughs> may maybe it's a, it's For possible. For some stuff, I imagine. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I don't know much about that world either, if I'm going to be honest. But anyway, the point is, in Unreal and Game Art, you want UVs. There are so few exceptions, okay? But anything that needs a certain color or or parameter in one area but not the other probably needs UVs. So my favorite part is grabbing the low poly and running the Z plugin of UV Master on it. That way, it will automatically unwrap which is the verb for UVing or for creating a UV um, that is in ZBrush. So the UV master will automatically unwrap your little guy. Normally, by default, it has symmetry on. If your model is not perfectly symmetrical, I recommend turning this off, okay? Because it will kind of like get confused. It'll be like, it's supposed to be symmetrical, but it isn't, ah, you know, that kind of thing. So I just turn that off and I'm going to hit unwrap. Every single low poly needs to be unwrapped, okay? You do not need to unwrap the high poly. That is a mistake I made when I was starting. That takes a million hours and it's worthless, okay? Do not unwrap the high poly ever. <laughs> it's okay, you don't need it normally. All right, so we're just gonna unwrap the low poly. There it is, you can tell it's already, already almost done. So the plane, again, since it's just a plane in ZBrush, it already comes with a really good UV map uh, as a primitive. But, you know, everything else needs to be UV'd. So even the little eyeballs are going to get UV'd as well. The thing is, is that um, lately I've been having this issue, like if I forget to UV a part, Substance won't even open it properly. Okay, so you got to make sure it's UV'd. So I'm going to select the little eyes as well. Go to the lowest subdivision, Z plug in, unwrap. Unwrap that little guy. There, that was fast. 0 0.08 seconds. All right. And then... What we're going to do is, now that we're UV'd, in case you ever want to check your UVs, the way is you're going to go to, in your tool panel. You're going to scroll down, UV map, morph UV. And that will basically just like flatten it out right in front of your eyes. Look at that cry little face. Fun. His little eyeball got split off from his head. <laughs> and then you're going to morph UV back. FYI, I've made this mistake before. If you have morph UV on and you export the FBX, it will still be flattened when you open it in the other software. <laughs> so make sure that it's not like that when you export. Okay. So I'm not going to be too picky and choosy about the UVs. Again, proper UV and proper retopology, that's a whole other month's topic. Okay. Uh, to get it all perfectly set up. We're just going for like really good enough for getting the job done you know once you are done with that and your low polys all have uvs everything's organized it might be time to export we're going to export these little guys as fbx's okay a lot of a lot of my students are like and i like there is no way to export or import fbx in zbrush and i'm like well you're just not looking in the right spot so the way to do so is under z plugin and you're supposed to go to FBX, import, export, right here, okay? There are multiple options. For example, you can just export the selected subtool, the visible subtools, or all subtools. So in my case, I want to select the visible subtools because I'm going to export the low poly as one FBX and the high poly as a different FBX. So I'm going to make sure that only the low poly for now is turned on with all of its visibility turned on and high polys are off. All right, so I'm going to go ahead. I don't really have any maps to embed, but if I had like um, if I had like textures, I would turn that on. Okay, but I don't really need to worry about anything else. The way to do it is just hit export right here. I already have one exported, so I'm not going to hit the button. Uh, but that's the only the way to do it. Then I'm going to hide the low polys and turn on the high polys, and then again, Z plugin export visible, export. That way, we'll end up with two different files on our computer. Let me find them for, for a second. They are in here. Baking, right, like so. So I have a Dragon Low FBX and a Dragon High FBX. You can see how much bigger the high one is than the low, right? So the low is going to load up faster and things like that. So this is what you want to end up with. So you're also going to name them properly because literally 
I, sometimes when I'm doing an actual like longer term project, I'll end up with so many of these that it's impossible to decode what the hell I meant when I wrote uh, dragon low low mid high low underscore final <laughs> two. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you want to be more careful than that, like that. So you know, just keep everything organized. That is literally the process to get a quick high and low poly out of ZBrush and into the wide open world of whatever else you want to do with it. Um, so hopefully that wasn't too complicated, but I think we went over a few of the basics, such as why you need UVs, why you even need a high and low poly, and what we're doing from here. Um, so I'm going to minimize ZBrush. Hope you guys like my super motivational background. I made it myself. Thanks. <laughs> Some of my mentees are like, can I have that file? <laughs> um, so I'm going to open up Sosun's Painter next. Okay, and this is the program, my favorite texturing program. Um, basically, you will get to paint textures and materials and things like that directly onto your mesh. Okay, um, I remember when Substance Painter came out, this is like groundbreaking because before people were using X normal to bake and they were using Photoshop to color and uh, do the, te the textures for their 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 models directly on the UV map. So like the, that 2D flattened version, people used to draw directly on that to try to get it done. Now we can draw directly on our models and yeah, the world is a nice place to live all of a sudden. Okay. <laughs> So let me show you how we get this started. First thing you're going to do is going to go to File and New. And we're going to start a new project. This is also when you import or like basically establish which mesh you want to work on. OK, so for File right here, I'm going to hit Select. And I'm going to choose my Dragon Low Poly. I'm pretty sure Low 2 is what I'm supposed to be using. Let's find out. See, this is why naming willy nilly is a problem. So. There you go. Now I have my file selected and I can choose my document resolution. So basically the higher the resolution of your document, the more resolution the textures are going to have. The thing is, is that substance is very lossless when it comes to texturing. That means that I can work, for example, in 512 the whole time and then I can export a 4K map and it will like automatically recalculate every layer to give it a 4K resolution. So it will actually look good in 4K, even though you textured it in 512. Does that make sense? So you don't need to go to the, for the highest option right off the bat, especially if your computer like mine has been struggling lately with just the most basic little things. Um, OK, so I'm going to do 1024 as my starting points. OK, and then I'm going to make sure that I don't have auto unwrapped turned on. Auto unwrap will unwrap my mesh, but my mesh is already unwrapped. OK, so I'm going to just leave that off because sometimes it's on by default. So I'm going to hit OK. And I'm going to look out for my little errors right here. There we go. Even with errors, we can still see my little guy. So let's do a little breakdown of the UI, because I think this is the first time I'm talking about Substance Painter on this channel. All right. So first, we have the most dramatic viewport of all time. We got the, the full version here and the splattered version on the other side. OK. So this here is going to be your 3D viewport where you can kind of like texture on directly into your model like so. And on the side, you've got the 2D UV version that you can also texture directly on if you wish. I use both for different reasons, but normally I use the 3D the most. So I'm going to make that bigger. OK. Um, then we have here kind of like the asset library that comes with Substance Painters. So basically all of my materials are on here my masks, my brushes. Brushes are fun. I like brushes. Um, and eventually, once I have textures, the textures will also be here. And I'll be able to access them through this little uh, like square button right there. So yeah, we have materials. And for example, if I wish, I can just drag materials straight onto my little guy. So like brass. Drag. Oh, it's kind of frozen on my cue. <laughs> there you go. Hooray, now he's golden. Wow, he's worth a lot more money all of a sudden. Rust, <laughs> there we go. You know, we also have smart materials that basically take into consideration his high and low points, his edges and crevices and things like that. And, you know, it tries that its best to utilize that. So I can drag that on. And you can tell that um, this is supposed to be steel painted, but it just looks like steel. Here's an important thing you need to take into consideration when using Substance Painter is that you need to bake 
So remember that baking process from high to low poly? You need to bake that because that will create a bunch of maps in the back end that control these things. Curvature, thickness, it, it measures the, the thickness of every part of your model, the curvature of every part, every part of your model, the ambient occlusion or whatever. And all of these smart materials, you use that as a guide. Okay, so like, you know, the little spikes eventually will become kind of part of the guide. Um, and so we'll, we'll get in onto all that. But basically, this is the assets. Here are the kind of like the little operations brushes or tools you can use, like so. So for today, we're mostly going to be using paint. We're not going to get into anything too fancy. But for example, just like Photoshop, you can use clone, smudge, uh, for, um, polygon fill, which is like the paint bucket, you know, kind of thing. Um, and a bunch of other little things. In fact, I always say... Um, if you know how to use Photoshop, you can adjust into using Substance Painter really easily. It's actually pretty close, in my opinion. Okay, so here we got our our tools. Okay, on this on the right here, we got the texture sets. So each each part of my model, each like sub object in my FBX, has come in as a separate UV set. So th these are the eyes. This is the fin. And this is the body. So I'll be able to texture each one individually and then eventually export each one individually. Then I have my layers right here, just like Photoshop, guys. I can add layers. For example, let me add a fill layer and I can change the color of my fill layer and it will just like fill the whole thing. Okay, just like Photoshop, you can change the opacity of your layer. You can change the um, blend mode, for example, from like multiply. You can't really tell too much but like you know tell you can change the blend mode to multiply or things like that okay so it's really really handy dandy and everything i think right now we're just doing a quick overview everything will make so much more sense once we actually get into it and start using it little by little then here we have the properties of each layer or each brush so in this case i have a fill layer and these are all the properties of my fill fill layer so i can choose for example let's skip ahead just a little bit, I can choose what channels it applies. So color is just the base color. Height is whether or not it creates an effect of height that will just be like texture based. Roughness is basically shininess. So if it's really rough, it's really um, not shiny, almost rubbery. And if it's really not rough, we call it glossy. It becomes like really, let me just show you, really glossy. Or rough is like super rubbery, like so. Uh, metallic makes it turns into metal. Okay. Uh, for normal, you know, we can change, for example, we can apply a texture to the normal map and make it like, you know, a bunch of, um, let's see if there are any normals around here. That looks like a normal to me. I can drag it on and it will like impact the normal map of the model, which is basically for those of you who aren't, don't come from the world of games, normal map basically creates an effect of, um, how the light is supposed to bounce from your model. You notice that it, the light, light is now bouncing differently right here. See that? As opposed to no normal. See? Isn't that weird? It's basically using color to tell the engine which way is up, which way is to the right, which way is to the left, which way is in, that kind of thing. So the color blends. You see these colors? They're telling us how the light is supposed to bounce of this model. This is one of the main parts of faking detail through texture. Oh, Elise says you can also use Photoshop brushes in Substance Painter. <laughs> so they are closer than I thought. <laughs> um, there you go. And basically all these different little parameters in here, for example, opacity, I can make him disappear, you know, little guy, poor little guy. And emissive, I think it can make him shiny. Let's see. He's just kind of glowing a little bit more, you know? Maybe I can give him glowing eyes or something like that. But for now, we're just going to make a miss of black because, you know, you can't glow with the color black. Like, there's no such a thing as, like, light that's black. You know, it's just black is the absence of color or of light. Therefore, black will take off that emissive. If I want to, I can, like, hide multiple um, channels and just kind of have one affect the creature for that layer. That Therefore, like, I've lost control over roughness and all of that stuff, but I'm going to keep them all on. Why not? Okay, uh, we also got a couple of more things like tiling, for example, like I can change the tiling of this layer. And since there's a normal map that's tileable on it, I can I can tile it like that. I can rotate the layer. Oh my God, we can make like a funky like music video for this little guy now. Just 
So uh, <laughs> maybe an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> and we can offset it as well. It's really not that not that complicated. It's just it's a lot of like information for anybody who might be here and never tried this before. I'm gonna go ahead and delete my layer. Okay, and we're gonna go back to the basics. So, like I said, to properly use Substance Painter, you need to bake the details. Sometimes you might not have a high poly. That's okay. Still bake the low poly onto itself, you know, and that will actually help it gain all of those maps that it needs. So the way we're gonna bake is we're gonna go out of the layers panel and we're going to go to texture set settings so in here you can choose all the channels of your project so right now it's set pretty well because it has opacity and things like that in it um if to in order to do the the, the cards for the fin you're going to want to have an opacity layer in your channel in your project so if you don't see this opacity you got to make sure you add it in okay all right and then we have right here this is the good stuff mesh maps this is where we're going to bake the mesh maps, all of these different maps right here, okay? So I'm gonna hit this Bake Mesh Maps button. And it's actually gonna bring me to this like brand new UI. I don't know if it's brand new, to be honest. I, I spent a long time not updating Substance Painter and now I updated it all of a sudden and it's new for me. I don't know if you guys know how long this has been here, but this is the new baking UI for Substance Painter that allows you to, again, bake the high poly textures into the low poly. First thing you need to notice is the output size. This is the size of the texture maps that it will bake out. So again, bigger means more high resolution, okay? So basically, let's do one at a time just to not confuse ourselves. I'm gonna hide the eyes and I'm gonna hide the fin and I'm gonna select the body, okay? So first things first, let's select which high poly mesh to use. I'm going to click right here. This is the hardest button to find, by the way, because um, it says right here, high definition meshes. And then it's just like, well, okay, how do I add it? It's right here, okay? So it's waiting for us to put in the high definition mesh that we want. So dragon underscore high. There you go. Let it think for a second. It's okay. I don't like to rush Substance Painter. That has never proven to be good, beneficial in my past. <laughs> okay. Um, and then... We're going to scroll down. And you guys see this right here? So under where it says match, I'm going to look at low poly mesh suffix and high poly mesh suffix. Remember suffixes? We set those up already. We set those up in, in, in uh, ZBrush. Remember we did a suffix underscore high, underscore high, underscore low, underscore low. So we can go ahead and set that up so that it automatically knows which one's the high and which one's the low and kind of avoids issues. I don't know if it takes capital letters into consideration. So I'm going to just make sure that I make it perfectly matching to my high and low, okay? Hey, glasses, I couldn't read that. <laughs> um, so now I know that all the low polys are underscore low and the high polys are underscore high. I'm going to, just for now, go ahead and bake my body low. See this big, big bake button? Bake body low. And let's see, it sh should right in front of our very eyes start baking some maps so we'll be able to see what they look like Ooh, very very pixely but hey look um let's see there are some maps that look really cool okay oh let's go back to painting mode which is coming out of the baking mode and we can already see some some details coming in oh that looks muddy but it's a start see so this is the process of baking Let's go ahead and go back to bake mesh maps. And this time, perhaps I shouldn't leave it at 512. I should go to a higher number. Like my project is set to 1024, which is the highest it's going to display. So I'll just do 2048 and then increase the size of my project. Bake. As you see it popping in, like briefly, the textures are pop in. You'll notice that they're already higher resolution. See? Nice. Okay, let's go back to painting mode. And I always do a little check. Looks like the the um, the wing fin got baked on, which is not good. On one side. But everything else looks decent. Let me go ahead and increase the size of my project right here. General properties, size. Let's do 2048. And we can see that that automatically made it look more high resolution. Not the highest resolution of all time, but it's decent. And what we're looking for is baking artifacts, like right here. 
normally these tight little spaces will have an artifact like this, which is basically when um, the the baker was too close or too far away to a part, or there were two overlap, uh, overlapping parts that, you know, kind of like baked on each other. So it looks like that might be the only area. This area here could be a little bit better, but there's no artifacts. It's just a little pixelated. So I'm gonna back, go back to the baker, bake mesh maps right there. And we're going to see this cage popping up in a second, let it think. Do you see this cage right here, like this outer perimeter of the mesh? This is basically how far out each polygon is, is being baked from, where it's clearly like anything inside of this cage is being baked. But right here in the area that we have a problem, can you see how the cage is overlapping itself? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the cage distances right here. Cage max frontal distance, max rear, rear distance. And I'm just going to kind of like try to make the cage a little smaller. See if that helps a little bit. And you never want to see red, OK? That probably means a bad thing. It means that the cage is going through the object. So let's just bring it down until we don't have any red. I really, uh, I think baking substance painter is good. But I really like baking with um, Marmoset Toolbag. Uh, Marmoset Toolbag has tools for baking that let you like real time paint your mistakes off. Basically, you know, you're like, oh, this little area has an issue, so you're gonna like just target it in that area, fix um, the bake, basically, like push the cage in, push the cage out, as necessary. But that actually doesn't look bad based on the preview. Honestly, do this as much as you need to. Like, don't rush this process. Uh, baking can be one of those things that makes or breaks the project. Um, oops, looks like I accidentally gave him a little white spot. Okay, so definitely be careful with it. You know, take some time. I know it can be like a big down downfall for a lot of my students, uh, especially hard surface baking. I would say that, in my opinion, like organic stuff like this is more forgiving with the bake than like, you know, hard edges and things like that. They can be a little tricky. Okay, so my little guy is baked. Oh, Chad, do you wanna add anything? Oh, sorry, I just had a quick question. Um, when you're making the cage, when you're adjusting the, the cage, uh, Zach's Not Dead had a great question about that. Like, could you uh, customize like um, how the cage is far away on like some areas and not others? like? Yeah. So Sorry, that's why I like Marmoset more. <laughs> but mm. you can actually use a cage file that you import yourself. So if you wanted to make your own cage and like manually tweak it so that that area isn't a problem, you could actually import a cage mesh yourself. I don't think there I don't think Substance has for now added those kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. But in Marmoset, you literally come in here with a little brush and you're like expand or sub or 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 shrink the cage and change directions and things like that. Um, so now let's go ahead and turn off the body and work on the fin for a second. So there's the fin low poly, okay, and the fin high poly. And you can see that there's a lot of red here. So I'm going to expand the cage until there's no more red, like so. There's a little bit of red on the outside, but that's because it's a plane. And so we can kind of like, if we wanted to look at it this way, we could see a lot of red, you know. Um, so this seems a little bit fine to me. And for the for the fin, I'm going to do the same bake, but I'm going to turn on opacity as well because again, we want to create that effect of like cut out, you know. So opacity will basically turn everything that it can't find any polygons for into this like black and white alpha. So like it will be black where you don't want to see it, and white where you do want to see it, and therefore it's going to create this like cut out effect. So I'm going to go ahead and just bake the fin and see what happens. This one took a few tries yesterday because it's a little bit more tricky to do like a, oh, looks like it's only using the um, the dragon body. Let's see. Okay, so that didn't work. Oh, it's not working properly. looks like it's only trying to use the, um, the little dragon body instead. So I have to troubleshoot and figure out why. <laughs> There's our bake, guys. <laughs> Figure out why it's only using the little body right now. So let's take a check a little look. Uh, 
this is the right file for sure let's see let me just maybe I named something incorrectly If needed, it will go back to ZBrush and just export just the fin on its own, just to see. Let me see if I made the... How weird. No worries. Oh, it's because I have the, uh, the wrong low poly open. <laughs> That's why. So let me go ahead and get the right low poly open real fast. This is, uh, remember that at the beginning, I was like, hey, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to get this number two or number one open. That's why. So let me go ahead and open up a separate file real fast. Because do you see these two little guys? This is like a learning moment. These two planes are both using the same UV space, and that can cause problems. So I have a different low poly that only has the plane on one side that will get us a good bake. And then we can, you know, copy the plane over at the end, which is what I did. So I'm going to go ahead and open the old version of this, which will only have the plane on one side. Give it a sec. Oh, and you can even kind of see a preview. So let me go ahead and get all that stuff away. Bake mesh maps. We're going to start by just pretending we don't see anything here. And it's literally the same, same exact setups as we did. Okay, so same high poly, same uh, suffixes. Okay, then I'll hit bake selected textures. And now it's actually baking that fin down onto the plane. This is actually the area that goes inside the body, so I'm not going to worry too much about the fact that there's little holes in it. Hey, Anna, another question uh, from Zach's Knock Dead that's pretty interesting. It looks like it's kind of answered on your screen, but are, are there colorblind accessibility options? Like, can you um, customize the color of the mesh? It looks like, I mean, I'm seeing the same kind of like uh, blue and pale yellow and red there. So it looks like in the baking visualization options, you can uh, customize that by just double checking that that's what that's changing. So like the cage might be hard for some people to see or like the, uh, the errors um, popping out or whatever. It looks like you yeah, can change the color. Totally. So okay. yeah, it looks like you can change the colors right here. So just change it as you wish. You can even like just turn this stuff off. You know, if you don't want the visualization, you can just turn it off all the way using these little check marks and you should be good. So hopefully that is, um, you know, enough, um, accessibility. I imagine it would be cause you can choose your own. Yeah, I think that would that would work. I mean, if all those colors were changeable to whatever you want, then that feels like mm -hmm. that would yeah. solve yeah, those things. Good. Thank you. That's a good question, though. Yeah. Okay, so now we've cheated a little bit, and we are back into business, okay? So that's a pro tip, I guess, is, like, please use the correct meshes and name your stuff <laughs> correctly, okay? Because don't be like me. So... One thing that happens, let me get rid of this layer. One thing that happens sometimes, let me turn these guys back on, is that every once in a while when I'm using Substance Painter, the um, the alpha, the like the, the cutout basically of the plane won't ap apply correctly. So right now it looks like, um, let me delete this. So this is what it would look like normally. So this happened yesterday and I wasn't able to, it didn't automatically cut out the plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a fill layer and I'm going to add the, take off every channel except for opacity. And then I'm going to use the texture that was created that cut out and I'm going to apply it that way it like forces it to be cut off. So I'm going to hit opacity and I'm going to search for opacity. Like so. And since I only baked one opacity alpha, it's easy to find. Like so. So now we have a fill layer that has this texture applied in the opacity. Okay, kind of how we applied the other textures earlier. And let me check the little eyeball. Looks like there's something wrong with it. Little eyeball, you see this? It's an artifact. It's the, the eyelid got baked onto the eyeball. All right. So what we need to do is I'm going to go back to the baker. And I'm going to make sure to deselect everybody except for the eyes. 
And for the eyes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, since I don't have a, a high poly eye mesh, do you remember that? I'm going to just hit this button here, use low poly mesh as high poly mesh. And that will basically bake itself on itself and make it a perfect like sphere that can still have, you know, um, smart, smart materials applied to it. So let's do that. I'm not going to do 4K. I'm going to do like, I don't need more than 512. Bake that and make sure that I select only the eyes. Bake eyes low. Eyes need more desperation. <laughs> Okay, returning to painting mode, this should be fixed and we can keep going. There we go. So there we have all of our different parts, okay? So I'm going to give you guys a crash course on my favorite way to texture a little, little creature with scales like this. Um, so the whichever texture set you select is what you're going to texture first. So let's start with the body because that's the most work. Okay, so I'm going to hit the body right here, and then I'm going to go to layers, and I'm going to start by adding some layers. I only ever work using fill layers. Uh, that's just my habit. I know a lot of people don't necessarily agree with that, but we're going to do my way today. <laughs> so fill layers, uh, the reason I enjoy them so much is because it's, it's a very friendly, lossless way to work. Let's say I'm doing multiple layers, and I decide that I don't want him to be brown. I want him to be blue. Instead of having to repaint him, or do other tricks, I can just come in here and just select the blue color, you know, that I want. I say as I add purple. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so that's personally why I like doing this. So the way I like to texture scales is I like to have a color for in between the scales and a color for the scale itself. So I'm going to start by making this layer into in between the scales. So scales in between. <laughs> I'm sure there's a name for this, but I'll never find out. Like so, scales in between. So now I'll choose whatever color I want to put in between my scales. I'm going to grab my uh, Pure F here, and maybe we'll, we'll see if I can be inspired by something or just completely make it up. Uh, I also have the colors of the um, original dragons that I was trying to redo, and I literally cannot make out what I was trying to do with this, the textures on here, but I made the in between the scales darker than the scales themselves. I always do that. If the scales are dark, I make the in-between light. And if the scales are light, I make the in-between dark. So let's start with just a random color like that. I, I, I do start with crazy color sometimes. And I like making the in-between of the scales to be really rough, not shiny at all, so that the scales, when I add shininess to them, really stand out, OK? It's all about contrast. So the in-between the scales is just going to be the base layer for everybody. Then I'm going to add another fill layer, and I'm going to call this one Scales 1 or something like that. So let me rename that Scales. And I'll name this one 1 because I might add a bunch at the end. Who knows? I'll make this into another crazy color, like green or something. And I'll make this a little bit shinier so that you know it really stands out from the base scales. But hey, it's completely covering up my in-between scales. So my, my work process is fill layers with masks. I'm going to right click this and I'm going to add a black mask. And what this does, it's going to, like in Photoshop, add a black mask to the whole layer, aka the layer is invisible. Okay. If I come down here all the way to the bottom, I can see all my brush options and I can see that now I have a grayscale slider for how I'm going to paint. If I paint with white, it'll actually reveal the layer in that area. If I paint with black, it'll hide the layer in that area. And any gray in between, depends on how much white and how much black it is, it will reveal or not reveal to certain degrees. OK? So for example, if I wanted to make him like stripey or something, I could come in here, and I could just paint on stripes. Great. <laughs> it's not what we're going to do, though. We actually want to, in some way, figure out a smart way to use a, a layer mask that already has scales on it. That way we can only you know, have the, the tall scales appear. Instead of a black mask, I'm going to use, or like a normal mask, I'm going to use a bitmap mask, which is a picture. Any picture that I want can be used as, a, an, as an alpha. So let me use something dramatic or something just to see what that looks like. I don't know, I'll use this for a second. And then I'll grab one of these crazy textures over here, like the brick or something. Select that fill, like that. So basically, the image is masking out that layer. 
Of course, we probably don't want polka dot lizard, unless you do. I mean, that's kind of fun, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the fill, and instead of using this this like polka dot texture, I'm going to find one of the textures that got baked by my project. In order to filter the textures by what got baked in your project, I like to go up here, all libraries, and you can select different libraries. And project is like where all the textures that are specifically for your project live. I always find that the curvature map is the best one for using for bitmap stuff like this. So curvature, drag that on. And you can barely tell, but you can see how there's a little bit more green on the scale. See that? There are ways to check the channels of your project. If you press C on your keyboard, it will actually go in and cycle through each one of the channels that you have. So, see that? And we can also use this drop down, and you can go back to materials to see what the final material looks like, or press M. M will bring you back to the final material. So we need to make this more dramatic, I think, right? Because it's really subtle. <laughs> the colors don't help that they're similar to each other, but it's pretty subtle. So what I'm going to do for the fill is I'm going to right click and add levels. Just like in Photoshop, we can adjust the levels of this image to kind of like, you know, make it more higher contrast. Like so. I like making it dramatic. I don't know. Yeah, the, the more together you put them, the more dramatic it's going to be. And you can also invert the, the image completely to, you know, have the, um, the mask basically invert itself. Like so. So we got a kind of a start when it comes to adding our little scales and having them show. Hooray, that's the hard part. <laughs> okay, so we can tell that the scales themselves are kind of shiny. The area in between is not. So let's go for a better color palette. I think I'm going to start off by matching the old dragon. So kind of just like a brown earthy palette, even though I know in my heart that that's not what I necessarily want. I will take audience participation on this one. What colors should I make this little guy? Let me know. Uh, so I'm going to just like, I think I'm going to go light on the in between. Maybe a little bit more warm just for now while the audience considers my dilemma. And then I think I'm going to go a little bit darker on the main. Oh, no, actually, I don't like that. The green doesn't suck. <laughs> Teals and oranges. <laughs> polka dot lizard. <laughs> we can polka dot him up later. Let's see what the teal looks like. Should have planned out the color palette ahead of time. Now I'm going to spend all day doing this. <laughs> but you see it, the beauty of the fill layers? You see how I'm not having to like manually do anything? I just can still change the parameters of the layer itself as I wish. That's the, that's the magic of it all. So we can make him green, like a teal green, and then we can add like orange stripes or something. I don't really mind. Like he's a funny little guy. He deserves funny little colors, I think. So I don't want to make it too dramatic either. Otherwise, it might look really, really fake. But that's basically the base, the base layer, just like that. Isn't that simple? So from here, you know, if I wanted to, I could make this. I think I'm going to make the scales a little bit shinier, like so. And let's say I wanted to add stripes or some sort of pattern to him. Okay. What I can do is I can just duplicate these layers as much times as I need for different colors. So I'm going to put them in a folder. Make sure that you don't change their order. Okay. Because, you know, if you change their order, it will actually, the uh, in-between area will just overtake. Just like in Photoshop, whatever is on top is on top, you know. And I'm going to call this, like, base scales. Then I'm going to duplicate this folder. So right click, um, duplicate layers, or you can just press control D on your keyboard. And now I actually have a brand new set of scales. So let's say I want to do like crazy teal um, stripes, right? So I'm just going to change all this, or not teal, I'm sorry, like orangey reddish color. Ooh, that actually didn't look bad. One thing about colors is that I use flux on my computer to like uh, reduce eye strain and I'm always making bad color decisions because I forget to turn it off. So pro tip, if you guys use anything that changes your computer screen's colors, like now's a good time to turn it off. 
And what I can do is inside of this folder here, I can actually add a mask to the folder itself. So this, this orange stuff, which is contained inside of this folder, I can just right click, add black mask to the folder. And now I can come in and paint that orange. And since it's a, it's a, since it's a folder, it actually contains both of those layers. So you see how the area in between the orange parts are darker, just to like make it stand out more like so fancy. Thankfully for us, Substance Painter has symmetry. <laughs> so, oh no, and I broke symmetry. It looks like I, great. We're just gonna ignore this. <laughs> We're just going to move right past that. Um, looks like my pivot point didn't take and it's using the wing as a way to also consider the symmetry. But let's look at the brushes. What are the brush options? All libraries, brushes, and we have so many brush options right here, you know, that we can use that are more natural for that blending. Oh, that, that actually doesn't look bad, the cotton. Like it, it kind of blends pretty really naturally, you know, between the different parts. Actually, I should have brought more reference. So I'm just going to do like kind of like a gecko effect. So at top one color, bottom a different color, and then like stripes along the tail. Sounds good, right? It's all about making executive decisions on the fly. <laughs> so I'm just going to make my brush. I'm going to just grab that and just kind of paint his little snout here. And even if you you think he's hideous, we can, it's okay. We can just change the colors. We can actually make as many as we need. Like we can export, you know, multiple versions of this little guy, and and yeah, just have a good time with it. So, gonna make my brush a little bit bigger to make this process a little bit more efficient. And don't be afraid of making mistakes because you can just refine the paint job by you know switching the colors. So right now I'm painting with white, and so if I want to erase, I can just press X on my keyboard to invert and paint with black, like so. Press X again to get that white back. I'm really not digging the, the teal, but I do like the orange. Next time we need to get a straw pull going. Hey, while you're painting, Anna, uh, Zax.net had another question that I had as well. Um, with the symmetry, when it didn't line up, it looks like you can't uh, fiddle with like the axis and put it where you want. I've never tried before. Oh, <laughs> let's me check real fast. So the settings are right here. Okay. Oh, it looks oh, like it's easier than I thought. Thank you so much for questioning my, my me because that helps. Sweet. So right here, this is the symmetry button, and then right next to it, symmetry settings. Sweet. This is why I don't like working by myself. I always stream. Gonna make the belly a little bit more bright. It's kind of painting. Yeah, you guys got any more questions while I paint? Do you know if uh, the uh, cool Photoshop brush shortcuts are uh, work in Substance Painter. Uh, like, which uh, um, You know, uh, left and right bracket for the size of the brush and That's shift and left and right bracket for the hardness. And uh, the uh, my favorite one is the just the number keys on the main area of the keyboard as a shortcut for um, opacity or like intensity and strength. So like if you wanted like 20% opacity, you just hit the number two. And then it would just jump to 20% opacity. So you could kind of cycle through uh, different. No, number two, turn on the, the eraser. So oh. the brackets, yes, they do work. OK. Um, but it looks like numbers cycle through the tools themselves. One, two, okay. three. And um, let me see, shift brackets for hardness. Mm, no, it looks yeah. like. Probably wouldn't be for custom brushes. If you just had like a regular like circle brush or something like that, it might work. But yeah, probably not for like a like your cotton brush with a pattern mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that you know, that might still affect the fall off? But we do have hardness right here, hardness, okay. so you can adjust it. So all your brush options are going to be right here. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure that there is some shortcut for the flow um, and uh, stroke capacity up there. Oh yeah, for sure. Very like you know, um, thank you, Elise, for the tips, shortcut tips in the chat. 
That's awesome. Yeah. We're almost done painting the base colors on. I'm gonna just paint the top of his little hand. Like so, and guess what? Now we can, you know, easily adjust all the colors and call it a day. You can spend as long on this as guys as you wish, by the way. Don't rush it. I, I've found that like a lot of people will see me do stuff really quick um, during demos and then expect that to be the actual speed that this gets done at. But like that's not the case at all. The demos are, you know, um, we have limited time when we're doing them. Um, so take that into consideration when you set standards for yourself. You know, it's important. I think I'm gonna just make him like nice and cute and yellow, making him like a little fired guy. And then I'll make this maybe a little bit more on the red side. Slowly turn him into a charmeleon. I don't know about you, Chad, but it makes me so mad that multiple monitors have different um, color setups, you know? Mm, I'm literally yeah. looking right now at my two monitors. I'm like, oh, my God. it's He's bland on one side and super colorful on the other, and I have no idea which version you guys see, you know? <laughs> yes. And poor Max is sitting there behind the scenes. It's like the like color experts being like, oh, it's so easy, you guys. Probably. Is it? It's, it's probably what he's saying because he's – Color wizard, color and show pro and show producer. So yeah, I wish he would tell us. Uh, maybe he <laughs> tell us after, like, hey, you know, because like I, every time I've looked into it, it's like you know you got to buy um, hardware to like you know mm -hmm. that, you know that stuff that like calibrates your monitors. But even yep. then, then it's just calibrated at your house or at your workplace, but it's not calibrated in the whole world, you know. Yeah, dude. I uh, I bought that hardware and it's still. My monitors are, it's like they're so close, but then a lot of content, it's just very, very different. So, yeah, I just try not to worry about it. Some of those things, I just yep. called that one a loss. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> count my losses on that and then call it a yep. day. Um, you know, that, that, that um, part, that, that prayer that's like, God, grant me the serenity to, <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. understand the things I cannot change. <laughs> <laughs> kind yes. of like that. Those, are, those are my vibes right now <laughs> yes <laughs> just like doing my best here <laughs> so i'm just i'm I love the, the same process as before i'm just adding a little stripes to him i love the flexibility of this workflow i i love the 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 fill thing that you showed with uh putting the layer mask the texture of the layer mask it's such a cool such a cool trick yeah this is the only way i work and um my mentees know it like whenever they send me other layers so there's a normal layer system in here too just like in photoshop where you can like paint directly on the layer and like just you know in, in, imbue it with whatever color uh information was on your brush at the time mm -hmm. but it doesn't give you all this flexibility and they already know don't even stand down on that stuff she will know <laughs> <laughs> like keeping people on their toes when it comes to some painter I'm just adding some random little stripes, trying to make a little pattern or something. Oh, there's another question from the chat that was pretty cool. Um, are you able to create a, a glass effect slash opacity with the wings? Uh, like, can you adjust opacity of the sculpt and add a metallic finish to it? Uh, and that's with like the the layer options, right? Like the metallic yada yada you showed us before. So if I wanted to do that, yes, but we will be doing some fancy shader tricks in Unreal soon in fact oh. I look at my clock we need to hurry up so we're almost running out of time um so let's call it kind of like here of course it's not finished i'm gonna finish it after the this event is over you know i, I do want this guy to be really cute and nice but you guys get the workflow right so we're doing fill layers and we're layering them we're using masks and then we can change the colors as we wish okay so unfortunately, I think it's time to start moving on. So let's get that fin textured really quick. So same thing as before, we're going to add a fill layer. So we're just going to leave this layer hanging out. You know, um, I'm going to put this one on top, like wing opacity. <laughs> Do not mess up. There you go. <laughs> you got to read yourselves comments in the layers. 
and this will be wing base color. So I'm gonna pick kind of a base color for the wing. By the way, there's like a little, um, you know, uh, what do you call this? Uh, eyedropper. Eyedropper. Use, if you wish. And I get it to match a little bit more. Maybe I'll make it a little bit darker to base color. And I'm gonna use the same exact process as before. I'm going to make the the base of a little bit more 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 rough. Then I'm going to add a new fill layer. And I'm gonna make this one a lighter color. And I'm going to make it a little bit more shiny. Oh, wrong direction. <laughs> and then, you know, bitmap mask. Let's see how that looks. So I'll just choose a, a random one. Oh, that one's actually nice because it creates a gradient. See, like you can just use anything for like a mask. I like this actually. Let's just stick with this. And then I'm gonna make the levels a little bit more dramatic. You know how I am. Just experiment a lot too, if you wish. Like that. And we can change the colors. So I'm gonna also like make make a new one of these layers. And instead I'm going to try layering on top um, instead of this opacity one, I'm going to do um, the curvature because I just really like the way the curvature ones normally look. And of course C to kind of like cycle through channels there's even a channel for mask so we can kind of see how the mask is serving us right now so this mask is nice because it's kind of hitting those like high points you know so if i wanted to I could change the levels on this and try to make the high points really uh dramatic let's see what we can do m to go back to normal and now like you see how the the little uh, curves that I put in. The curves are kind of a different color. So if I wanted to change the color on this, I could try. So maybe I'll do like a funky thing with the wing. Maybe I'll finally get that teal in that was wished for before. I'm gonna duplicate this layer and just hide the original and just, just practice, see what happens. Whimsical, kind of. Well, kind of like crazy, but it's a little whimsical, which is what I'm going for. <laughs> uh, yeah, gonna... if I saw this thing in the street, I would be like, okay, that's, that's a blizzard. <laughs> that's my pinky lizard. So this seems like an obvious question, but like, you can paint on individual channels too, right? Like uh, the mm -hmm. interface feels like there's just so much going on. I'm guessing like if I wanted to paint, for example, on the opacity channel of the wing, with like a middle gray to give it like partial transparency or something like that, then you could do that yeah, as well, right? I could. Okay. So here's how I would do that. I would, of course, use a fill layer. <laughs> Hide every single uh, channel, except for op for opacity. And for example, like I could just um, turn down the opacity. I guess it's not letting me properly. Maybe it's because this thing is overriding it. So maybe I should layer these and make sure that this is set to multiply because uh it looks like it was overriding it completely so let's let me check what i might be doing here keep uh, accidentally pressing b to like change brushes and um what do you call it um it, it goes to a different setting that is not photoshop <laughs> <laughs> Where's my... I, don't, I didn't mean to derail you. Like it, Just like knowing that that's possible is cool. It should be. It's just that it's being difficult. Probably because I didn't set it up um, at the beginning perfectly. But if I set it all the way to the top, let me see if it's the pass through. Yeah, I'll figure out a way to make both work. But you can. So like if I, if I get my little brush... And I turn that to uh, add black mask. Give me one sec. Let me think this through. So this one's already overriding the, the main part of the wing. So if I should set this to multiply, perhaps, and set it to off, I guess not. I s oh. Okay, we're getting somewhere. So I first, I, the first problem was that I had the mask set to white, like the opacity set to white. Mm -hmm. um, so that was actually just filling it with more opacity, but it didn't need more opacity. 
So let's see. And then I can come in here and just paint that off. So that was just me setting the settings wrong. But you see how I'm like turn taking off a little bit of the opacity? Yeah, 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 for sure. And if I did it like halfway, it would maybe be oh, never mind. Also, it doesn't like halfways. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, it's kind of like I think in Unreal, it's it's very well explained. Like um this is going for like a cutout effect, which only takes in white and black input. But you can also do like translucent, which takes in the the middle parts. But I think I would have to change the setups of the entire project, and I'm not totally sure where to go from there. <laughs> gotcha. No, no. I was but I'm not sure about that, was... that question. Like, you know, I think I would have to do a little extra research on that. Oh, that's great. I was just curious. Um, Thank you so much. No, no worries. Maybe somebody in chat will fill in the gaps. Okay. So uh, I want to use the same texture that I did in, in ZBrush for the eye little eyeballs instead of painting in the new eyeballs in here. So that's two options. You can paint them in, or you can use the same texture as before. In order to extract the same texture, I'm going to come into ZBrush and select my little eyeballs. OK. I'm going to make sure that they're divided up pretty far. Because the texture resolution in ZBrush will actually matter if it's like low low poly or high poly. It will just create kind of like a more pixelated texture. And I want to use this as my texture. This is poly paint, which is just a different way of saying vertex painting, which means that each vertex has a color, but it's not necessarily a 2D texture. So what I'm going to do is, since this eyes are already, um, already UV'd, I can scroll down, go to texture, map. Create and create from poly paint. New from poly paint. Click that, and now it has created these little maps that have my poly paint on there. I can go ahead and hit clone texture, texture, and I'm going to do. Um, I believe I have to flip flip V. Normally with ZBrush you have to flip V before you do anything because in ZBrush the UVs are normally upside down. So I'm going to flip the UVs so that they match. Substance Painter, see that? And then I'm going to export. And you can just export this as a, as a little uh, texture map. Eyes. So I'm going to call this T for texture underscore eyes. T for diffuse, which is a different way of saying the color, base color. And then I can just open that up in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to File, uh, Import Resources, Add Resources, find that thing that I just did. Textures. Where's my little eyes? Right there. Like so, I, you have to always select what type of of a type of file. So this is a texture. Import to this project, and now I can just fill my little eyes with a fill layer and add the the texture right to the base color. Like so, very nice. Let's also make it shiny. Great. All right, since we're running out of time, we only have 40 minutes left, and I have to get through the entire Unreal portion in that time. Let's go ahead and export, OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to export all the textures for this little guy through the exporter. So File, Export Textures. And I'm going to make sure that all of these are selected. These are the textures you want to export. I'm going to select the Unreal Engine 4 packed type, like type of textures. This is going to like make it really easy to use with Unreal. There are so many different outputs that you can have. You can have Unity templates, Renderman templates, Roblox. That's the first time I'm noticing the Roblox temp template in here. I did not know that was in here. Dota 2, all this stuff. So you, Unreal packed. What that's going to do is going to take like the met metallic and roughness and uh, ambient occlusion and pack them into a single texture, just more efficient. And then I'm going to export. Let me make sure I put it in the right folder. New folder, textures, demo. Open that up, select, and export. So it's going to export each one of these te textures, and it's quite a few, probably more than you need. Looks like it's exporting emissive, even though it didn't really paint with emissive, but it's OK. It's all good. I'm going to open up Unreal, Unreal 5 specifically. Let me delete this little guy. Bye. And what we're going to do is we're going to start in Unreal by taking a quick look at the UI. OK, so we're going to be diving into the UI in multiple processes way more 
throughout this month. This is just the first time we're opening Unreal. The most important thing we need to learn today is how to import files, how to save, and of course, how to make materials, okay? And then next time we're gonna be setting up the scene and we'll learn way more, okay? So basically here's the viewport. This is where the scene actually takes place or your level. Okay, so level, map, scene, those are all interchangeable names. Okay, navigation in here is actually really flexible. There, there is more than one way to navigate, but if you know Maya, that's one of the main ways to navigate. To the left, we have the modes panel. So for example, we have like the placing of actors. I can add in a light like so. I can add in cone oh my god i love a good cone like i you'll see like whenever i'm teaching my tech art class in college everything's a cone like i can't do math without cones guys so you can add in little things into your scene basically like default simple assets down here is the content browser this is the most important thing of today this is where all your files live instead of on a real project you're going to have a lot of sub files that all are like u types so like um um what do you call it Like a map, for example, is a U map, things like that. And they only open in Unreal. And inside of these is where all of your files live. Okay, so for example, my little dragon that I had already imported is inside of meshes right here uh, and all sorts of good stuff. So this is where we're going to browse to all our projects and, and files. Then right here is all the outliner. This is all the stuff that's in the world right now. So for example, this floor is here. And here's the details panel where you can change the details of just about anything you have selected. So for example, for the floor, I can change its rotation. And I can change what material is on there. Bolt instead. Woo, very nice. And then um, that is basically all you need to learn right this instance. Okay, we don't need to like go into the entire engine right now. Let's go ahead and import in our little guy. So I already kind of have him in here. So I'm going to create a new folder called, well, actually, I'll just put it in here in meshes to keep it organized. And I'm going to make a new folder. So I'm going to call this one Demo Dragon. Open that up. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag in the FBX. This time I am going to use the low two because he had two little wings in the low two. Oh, I'm like, why is it not doing anything? Oh, it's just me. I just need to move my window. Okay. So here are your importing settings. Okay. So um, you can, for example, if you know that it's going to come in small, you can make the uniform scale a little bit bigger. And normally by default, it says material import method, uh, create new materials. Do not create material. I personally hit don't create material normally because I don't want to deal with a bunch of like random materials in here. I just like to make my own. I'm going to make him a little bit bigger because I know that whenever you're using ZBrush, sometimes it's hard to control the scale of your objects and they end up tiny. So I'm going to make him automatically 10, uh, 10 times bigger. And I'm going to hit import all. And it's going to import each little part of his body like so. Great. I'm going to select all three of those and drag them into my scene. You can use the little gizmo to rotate and place him. It's a little bit of exposure in here. OK, so to scale and rotate, you're going to press W to move, E to rotate, and R to scale. I don't think it's quite the same as ZBrush. The, the R and uh, E are inverted. OK. So there is our little guy, it's beautiful little wings. Oh, they're invisible from the back. It's all good. We're going to change that. I'm going to also add a little color, a little light, I think, just to you know make it easier to see him. There we go. That seems reasonable. And you can tell that this is definitely the low poly, right? Because there's no none of those details in yet. And this grid means that there's no material applied. Okay, so it's just the default world's grid material that goes on anything that doesn't have material. Let's go ahead and import in our textures. I'm gonna go to my textures folder that I made earlier, but you can just make your own texture folder. Right click new folder, and I'm gonna call this textures demo. <laughs> then open that up and let's go navigate in here to my textures, textures demo. Beautiful. I don't really need the emissive because the emissive is supposed to be a glow and I literally didn't even set that up. Okay. So I'm just going to drag in all the base colors, normal maps and the what I call the arm <laughs> uh, texture. So it's 
uh, ambient occlusion, roughness, and metallic. Drag those in. And just going to import those. Gorgeous. Okay, those are my textures right there. And we're going to be able to apply them to materials. Okay. Uh, furthermore, in Substance Painter earlier, I had exported... Oops. I had set, done the settings, file, export textures. I had done the settings in a specific way to export also the opacity. Where is the opacity in here? With alpha. Okay, so make sure that if you're using opacity, you have with alpha done. So I'll just export that to a separate folder just in case. And export that. Oh, I left everything else on too. Great. It's all good. I have endless storage. <laughs> okay. So now I also have a new folder that, that has the alphas. Let that load. And there we have the black and white alpha that we can use for our fin. Like so. So let's make some materials for this little guy. Okay. So I'm going to go to my materials folder. New folder in here. Materials demo. Open that up. And we're going to make some materials to actually apply those textures. That's the only way to apply the textures is through materials. I'm going to right click and say material. And then I can name it. I like using the official like Unreal conventions for um, naming. So M underscore uh, dragon body. If I can spell it. Zero one. And I'll go ahead and just apply it to his little body, just right off the bat. There's nothing to change because there's nothing inside of my material. I'm going to open that up. Drag it in. It was on my other monitor. And I'll just go ahead and tab it up to the top here. So now I have two tabs, the level and the material. Okay. So what we're going to actually, let me not tab it up yet since we're going to be dragging stuff into it. I'm just going to make it right here on top. The material editor is right here. And all of these are the inputs for like, putting things into base color, specular, roughness, uh, emissive, things like that. So basically we'll be doing all of our setups right here and then we're gonna connect it in with nodes. So let's go find my textures and let's drag in all of the dragon body related textures. All you have to do is just kind of grab that. Oh, I'm using the wrong folder. There's the base color, there's the normal map and there's the arm, <laughs> okay? So all we're going to do is we're going to connect the RGB of the base color into the base color. We're going to connect the RGB of the normal into the normal. Kind of can even preview it here. It should look kind of like the, the light is bending. Do you see that? It's actually affecting the scales. And the, the arm is where it gets tricky. Okay. First things first. Um, Unreal does not read these textures right off the bat well. So if I try to connect these all now, we'll see that it looks funky. Let's go through that. So... Um, the red channel goes into ambient occlusion, green channel goes into roughness, and blue channel goes into metallic. Um, I had to, I couldn't remember, like I spent years having to look this up every time because I could have forgetting which one goes in which. So this is how I memorized it, okay? Um, roughness is green because when you're camping, you're like roughing it out on the grass. <laughs> okay, that's great. Great first start. Uh, metallic, you know, like in like animes and stuff, like sometimes when you're like painting metallic colors, like on a gun or something, it's kind of like a blue highlights. That's how I remember that. Uh, metal is kind of blue sometimes. And then the red is just the leftover. <laughs> the other one. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I memorize those. But if we apply this material and I, and I let that load. Okay. Oh my gosh. You'll notice that he might be a little too shiny. Okay, I, I don't know if I set him up too shiny or not, but here's the thing. When it comes to these kinds of textures, we need to open them up and turn off sRGB. So to open to open them up, you just double click the texture and here's all the details of the texture. sRGB, turn that off. And basically it'll let Unreal know that it's not supposed to be red like a color texture, it's supposed to be something else. So I'm gonna go ahead and reapply this here. And let's see if there's any difference. Apply. And now it's not quite as gleaming. You see the difference, especially in the back here. 
So that is actually something that will trip people up nonstop. Like there, at least when I was learning Substance Painter, there was no documentation anywhere that said turn off sRGB, you know. And even nowadays, um, sRGB is most found like most commonly found in forums, not even official documentation or tutorials. So, you know, you got to make sure that you set that up correctly. So that is the basic, basic little setup of the body textures. Okay. And Anna, what was that name of that like weird map with it? You split the channels out from? Uh, it has, was like, the, oh. I, I call it the arm, <laughs> but it's okay. basically the, the packed map that contains roughness, metallic and um, ambient, ambient occlusion. occlusion. Yeah. That's wacky. Okay. It's very wacky. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> So then let's go ahead and set up the rest. So I'm going to go back to materials, create a new material for the fins. So M underscore fin underscore zero one. Apply that to the fin like so. And we can, we got a couple of options here. Let me un untab that so that we can kind of see the stuff we're dragging in. Let's go to textures. And let's bring in everything fin related. So there's a the fin normal map. There's the fin alpha. There's the fin arm. <laughs> and oh, I'm using the wrong place again. And there's the color. OK, so before I even get anywhere, I'll open up the fin um, and sRGB off. Save that. Like so. OK, and let's go ahead and connect everything. So this one goes into the base color. This one goes into the normal map. This one goes, oh, there is no opacity. See that? It's grayed out. Oh, I bet I can connect it anyway, but it's not going to work. The idea here being that you actually need to change the material type in order for it to allow for opacity. So right now, this material is opaque. If I look right here, all the way in the left, tiny little button, blend mode opaque. If I change that to masked, it will actually let me do an opacity mask. Like so, save, and let's check it out. Give it a second. There we go. And see how it's kind of like cut it out. And then, of course, green the roughness, blue in the metallic, and red the leftover in ambient occlusion. Let's save that and see how that turned out. Doesn't look too much unlike what it was supposed to look like. So we'll keep it like that for now. And then, of course, the little eyeball, right? Let's go ahead and again, materials. So we're just doing the same thing over and over again. New material, M underscore eyeball. Open that up. And for this one, I don't have a lot of maps, remember? Like, I kind of just have the color and technically I have um, I have roughness and whatnot but I don't really need it since it's just all the same I can just add it directly into here but there's the color RGB goes in there and yeah that's it I'm gonna save that and then I'm going to apply it to the little eye browse and I'm just going to drag it on good the roughness is looking a little rough so let's go ahead and add a single number remember that the roughness gosh there's so much to go into i should have made this a two-parter but basically the roughness remember this from the substance painter basically we can change it by going from black to white and that will make it shiny or less shiny right so in unreal we can do the black to white being a number value so black being zero and uh white being one so we can add a number value and plug it in directly to the roughness and it'll actually affect it. So if I add a number, for example, if I press one and hold and click down to add a single number and put it into roughness and I make it super shiny by turning it to zero and I save that, it will make it super shiny. It might almost be too shiny, especially because I have plans to do like a glass. Actually, it doesn't even look that bad. Like so. OK, so we basically have our, our materials done. Here's an important thing that you need to know if you're newer to using Unreal is there is a save button up here. Where is it? There. 
There's a save button. This save button only saves the current map that you have selected. Okay, so this will only save the scene. You have to actually save each individual file type if you want it to actually be saved. Or you can hit the Save All button here, and everything that's been modified will get saved all at the same time. So you can kind of see a little list, Save Selected, like so. So you would just save this um, and go from there. All right, so there's the basics. The wings are not visible from the back, so I think we can do more <laughs> with the wings. So let's bring that back. It's so awkward with just one screen. We're going to click on the material itself, and then we're going to do two-sided right here in the details. And basically what this will do is it will apply the material to two sides of a plane. You normally don't want to use two-sided for everything, just things that are like plane-based. OK. Uh, if you wanted to do more of a translucency effect, you would, instead of using masked type, you would choose a translucent type, like so. And this would basically create more of a, um, I gotta make sure I set that up to go into opacity now. This would create a more soft translucent effect of like, you know, it doesn't have to be fully opaque or fully masked in not every area, you can do in between. I don't have the right map for that. So what I could maybe do is just multiply this by black to show you what it would look like with a little bit of black mixed in, which is more opaque or uh, less opaque, sorry. So in here, you can actually do like math and uh, operations. So I can multiply this in here to make it darker, just like we would in Photoshop. You know, if you multiplied a black layer over the top and you, you know, made it darker. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and say multiply. I'm going to plug that in to the opacity. And right here inside of this node, I can pick how much I'm going to multiply by. So I'm going to do 0 0.5, which is like kind of like a grayish color. And I'm, I can hit apply. Oh. And now it's a little bit on the way too translucent side, right? And of course, you can use different masks and things like that to actually affect this. So for example, maybe some of the masks from Substance Painter might actually look pretty good if they if used for translucency purposes. We can go export those. They did not apply. Okay, so that's a little bit less dramatic. Let's take the floor off. Like so. So there's a way to export single um, textures out of Substance Painter. Let's, let's go remind me how, how to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to export the resource. So I'm going to go here for textures. I'm going to go to Project and choose some sort of texture for the wing that looks like it could work as far as roughness. Maybe this one. Maybe this one. And I'm going to try to export it. Let me do it on the outside here. It's thinking. And let's see if the file type is correct. Go back here to textures. And let me grab it. OK, there it is. Let's see if that looks good at all on the fin material. I didn't actually plan this part, so I was just doing it because you guys asked about it earlier. <laughs> I could maybe multiply these by each other instead of a number and see like if the darker areas here will darken the areas here. Apply. Maybe if I make it more dramatic. But we are practically, practically done. Do you guys have any questions or anything? I think that's great. Oh, uh, earlier, Elena had a question about um, UVW stuff. Um, I, I, I don't know if, uh, if you have the answer, but um, she was saying unwrap 
UV creates uh, just in substance creates like a random looking map, but it's very fast versus like in Maya, uh, it would create like a very neat UV, um, but it would take some time. Like, are there pros or cons production wise to uh, the different methods to uh, create UV maps? Um, yes. Does it matter if it's like sloppy or. <laughs> So, yes, um, it does matter to some degree if it's sloppy because um, the sloppier the map, the more difficult it's going to be to manually um, manually texture the object. It could create scenes. Um, for example, like if you had like a scene kind of like where the, the map gets cut, like right down the face, it could look funky, you know. Um, so you definitely want to be neat with it um, nine times out of ten. Um also more judged judged you know like if you're trying to put it in your portfolio like i only show off uv maps if they're absolutely like perfectly refined and things like that otherwise i just leave them out like that's how important they are that's super important skill to be able to do really nice uv maps and imagine like if you had to like paint a line across the uv map and it goes everywhere you know like you have to have like nice straight uv maps whenever possible um the 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 size of each island like each area of the uv map that gets um each area of the model that gets cut into a UV map, um, basically, uh, how do I put it? They should all be the same size. Otherwise, when you're trying to bake and texture, you'll have high uh, areas that look really high definition and areas that look really low definition, for example. So it's really tricky. You should probably do it uh, properly. <laughs> um, but for this, like for like quick things or things like rocks you know that don't quite matter quite as much um it's a good idea to you know you can just use uv's uv master or in a pinch <laughs> i mean every time i've done a game jam for example i do it like this <laughs> you know and it works out just fine um so yeah any That's any other cool. questions uh, i think that was it um yeah that's awesome. I learned a lot. Like the uh, the RGB uh, map that uh, where you take different bits and pieces. Is that a substance thing, uh, or is that like a a thing that I just don't know about that I should? Know um, about? Which parts exactly? Like that that weird um, arm map with the taking oh, the different like channels. the packed. Yes, yeah. like green roughness is is that like a common thing in other apps, or is it just from sub substance? Because typically, like, there's, like, usually, like, a, a map that's, like, just ambient occlusion or just roughness or whatever. No, so. yeah. You can – so in Unreal, the pack is just a little bit more efficient. Normally, when I'm using other so uh, software, I just do, like, one map for roughness, one map for metallic, one map for this and that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never really exported it any way out of anywhere else. Um, in fact, you know, like, I've never really used that many different texturing software because like just recently marmoset started doing texturing and substance sampler and things like that um but before substance was kind of the go-to you know mm -hmm. so I, I have to go find the other the other uh, options now <laughs> and try them out soon I'm just kind of like lighting this little guy because i i like lighting them so <laughs> just... <laughs> such a cute character those hands my goodness, I want to like tattoo those hands on my face. They're so adorable. <laughs> it's the cutest things in the whole world. <laughs> just wants to high five the planet with love. It's really cute. Yeah. Since we have like, you know, an extra few minutes, um, I'll show you guys how I would pose him in ZBrush. Cute. Yeah. So, um, okay, so here's an important part. If you are going to pose the character, do it after you have the low poly done, you have the, um, you have, what do you call it, the, the UVs done and everything's done. That's how I do it. I don't pose beforehand. Let me go ahead and duplicate this little wing off to the other side. So I'm going to duplicate the wing and I'm going to go to deformation and mirror on the X. That way, that's, this is how I did it originally to so get the two wings. And I'm going to merge the subtools just for now. Merge down like so. Um, so always go, you know, lowest subdivision on everything. Make sure you're doing this on the low poly, not the high poly. Okay. 
And then you can just come in here and start kind of um, posing it. I like using the Z plugin, the um, Transpose Master, which basically um, creates, puts everything together into a single subtool in its lowest um, resolution and makes it way easier for you to pose. So let's try to figure out a pose for this little guy. I'm going to kind of like ignore his wings for now because I think I can just like move them at the end, just whatever position we put him in. So let's try like using the bend curve first on the whole body, like some sort of um, crazy, oh, mesh is partially hidden, of course. Bend curve. And then I'm going to select the body. Invert that selection. I'm going to, just like the last time we showed it, kind of getting a little bit of a, a bend on there using these little these little points, maybe I'll increase the curve amount and get like a little bit more going. I just like, like adding like a little bit of a curve to the spine this way. Um, it just kind of helps a little bit. I wanted to go back to just three points. Something like that, like funky, you know, like he's swimming or something. I just don't want his head to be too deformed though. Okay. Accept. Maybe I'll just hit the, his little head with um, a little bit of extra move. Just kind of straighten it out a bit. Then maybe I'll do um, this leg will be a little bit bent. I'll just kind of mask out the, the anything going on the knee. Then use my little um, gizmo to just kind of bend from the knee. Because he's going to be swimming, right? So we'll just try our best here. I'm going to just raise up this little arm because I think it's going to be cute if I do. Rotate it from over here. I always try to rotate it from where it would, the, the, the arm would actually bend. But to move the gizmo, you just alt click wherever you want to pivot from. Not too much because I might ruin those little spikes, see? Let me actually improve the mask around here to kind of like mask out those spikes. Something like that, kind of like just a simple, simple effect, you know, making it asymmetrical, making it a little bit more fun. I'm just going to grab the tail and maybe like bend it a little bit more on its own. Is that bend constrained to like a the 2D axis of the viewport or is it moving it in 3D? 3D. Okay. But this is just a move brush, but the bend deformer that we did earlier, yes, it was um, 3D. Okay. It was basically constrained to the mesh itself. Ooh, what happened to his little eyes? Okay, they're fine. They're fine. Crisis averted. <laughs> 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 All right, let's get that bottom leg. Like, just straighten it out a little bit more. So Saber has a question in the chat. Uh, never use the Z-spheres for posing. Uh. Personally, I don't like using the Z-Series for posing. So basically, remember the Z-Series we used for the little arm in the first season, or last week? Um, you can actually use those as a way to pose. You can like, constrain the, the ZBrush model to it. But I, I personally, it's not my favorite. I just I have never found like, truly re um, reliable results with that particular method. Just like the way that the mesh deforms, is that what's not reliable about um, it? It's 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 kind of like rigging, you know. Um, the thing being that um, you don't get to con control what each Z sphere is affecting on your mesh, mm. you know. So that's why I don't necessarily do that very much. I'm gonna just kind of rotate these wings and replace them on the body. Like so, and now I can go ahead and 
um, go Z plugin, transpose master, T pose to sub T, which will basically bring that pose back into my current model, like so. And then I can export the low poly again. So making sure that no high polys are on, Z plugin, FBX, export, import, visible, export. Let me select the low poly, drag and low. And I'm going to name this one like posed or something. <laughs> Wait a second for it to finish. And then I can import it in here. So I'm going to go to meshes, import, new folder. Open that up, import. Let's go find it. I'll make it 10 times bigger again. It was already set that up. And then dragging that in right next to my little guy, we can see that now we have a posed version as well. And the best part is that the textures will still work, or unless I mess something up. <laughs> I'll have to copy and paste the UVs on again. Looks like everything's good except for the body. We can troubleshoot, no problem. Oh, it's because I use a different version of the low poly. Remember how I, I uh, UV'd it at the beginning? I use a different UV for this one. But it will work, I promise, if you just use the same version of the files. <laughs> but, you know, it's all good. It's all good. We're just doing our best. Any last final questions before we wrap up, folks? Not seeing anything in the chat. All right. Well, I think that's practically it for today. So basically, uh, we learned how to take it out of ZBrush, get it through the texturing pipeline, and how to get it into Unreal and get the materials on. Next time we meet, we will talk about how to actually do a scene setup in Unreal. We're going to be using some Quixel assets um, and just kind of like building out a fun little scene for this little guy. Um, maybe doing even a little lighting and things like that. And then the final week, we're going to add particles. We're going to um, add some fun stuff that might even use some Cinema 4D plugins, right, Chad? <laughs> sure. Sweet. Yeah. Um, totally. We'll have to talk about that. But yeah, probably. Yeah, sure. we will talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> no promises, folks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, thanks so much, Anna. It's fantastic as always. I appreciate your. Uh, wisdom and answering all the questions and juggling all that stuff. I can't believe like, I can't believe how much you know about every step in this <laughs> process. It's like, it's incredible. So oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for being so generous with your knowledge and such like that. And uh, yeah, just remember our shows that we have uh, going on here. Um, and we'd love to see you more and love to see you next week as well. And uh, yeah, maxon.net slash events. Thank you, Max. Thanks again, Dr. Sassy. Thank you all for joining us for your comments and questions. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care, everybody.